Alex, good to see you. Hi, Tianwei. Great to be with you. How much the technological fragmentation we are seeing as a result of geopolitics and other factors are having an impact on the sharing of technologies at this moment regarding addressing the issue of aging from your perspective? Sure. So uh, right now we see major polarization in and deglobalization everywhere, uh, predominantly driven by economic forces. And one of those economic forces is actually aging. So the population of major developed economies uh, is aging as well. And uh, people who are older, uh, they may not uh, think about the future in the same way the younger generations do. And uh, currently, we see that um, uh, this deglobalization is already affecting many areas of our economy and technology in artificial intelligence, in telecommunications, in mobile uh, in energy, so everywhere, uh, in uh, automotive, even on clean energy, right? So believe yeah. it or not, everybody is trying to unite to fight climate change. Uh, but even there, we have multiple geopolitical issues. Uh, and in biotechnology, we don't see uh, that area being affected as of yet. So we see some early birds, uh, for example, uh, this area requires very substantial investments. And uh, when there is polarization in investment and uh, the restriction of capital flows from one country to another, uh, if you are a truly global biotechnology company, which uh, utilizes the resources and the infrastructure uh, and the best uh, quality uh, services in every country that it operates in, um, that area is, of course, uh, represents some difficulty. How are you addressing this challenge? Uh, trying to build hubs in different parts of the world as we are in the multipolar world? So we are trying to be truly global. So I refuse to be uh, subject to those geopolitical winds at this point in time because our service is to the people globally. It's not to a specific nation. And uh, um, we try to avoid getting into anything related to geopolitics uh, and uh, uh, stay above uh, this trend. Uh, most of the investors that we work with, uh, they focus on technology and biotechnology and uh, they evaluate the effectiveness and quality of the drugs that are in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And of course, we as a company, we try to be truly global and set up uh, sites uh, internationally where we can find the best talent and use the best resources because we serve the patients at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, we also expand into the Middle East to ensure that we take advantage of that neutrality and geopolitical um, fluency. Artificial intelligence is one of those areas uh, there seems to be encountering enormous amount of geopolitical challenge, but at the same time, it's one of the best tools that are bringing us to the next stage, uh, I mean, in terms of human society. So how are you looking at tapping into advantages of the development of these technologies? And at this moment, what are some of the problems you encounter? Are you looking at new options to solve those problems? Sure. So artificial intelligence allows you to very um, significantly speed up and cost down the process of drug discovery. So very often we do not understand the mechanism of disease, uh, why Alzheimer's happens, we don't know yet, right? Uh, why um, many cam uh, cancers happen, we don't know yet. Also, it allows you to very rapidly discover and design molecules with the desired properties that do not exist in natural world, right? So now we are talking about AI imagination. So when you're bringing those two AIs together, biology AI and chemistry AI, and also put it on top of a robotics platform that can very quickly accelerate the validation, the testing of the AI hypotheses, uh, we've demonstrated many times over that it significantly uh, reduces the time cost and increases the probability of success at the preclinical side. But when you go clinical, so when you start testing those drugs in humans, there you have to move with the speed of traffic. So AI allows you to go from zero to, let's say, 100 in seconds, so to speak, right? But then you are moving with the speed of traffic, moving at, uh, you know, 60 miles an hour. Uh, 
because it's a very regulated area and you still need to spend several years, sometimes a decade in human clinical trials before you put the drug on the market. So our main problem right now is that uh, a, it, it takes you six months to develop a great AI model uh, to solve a very significant challenge, but then it takes you a decade to validate it. And that decade also requires funding, requires people that uh, uh, will be with you during that long journey if you are to do it yourself. We have seen um, different countries developing their kinds of so-called moonshot projects related to health and aging issues. How do you see approaches like this uh, for, from where you are? And do you see this as bringing more fragmentation or do you see this as more uh, bringing more energies together uh, in order to tap into some of the biggest challenges that we have today? I think those moonshot projects are extremely important. Uh, you know, the Cancer Moonshot Project pioneered originally by the U.S. Uh, brought in additional more than $5 billion into cancer research. Uh, and of course, this money usually spreads around the world because part of that goes into contract research organizations that perform chemical mm -hmm. synthesis and uh, uh, biological validation uh, in Asia. Uh, part of that goes even into Africa. So usually it goes uh, broadly uh, because uh, biotechnology is such a broad and collaborative field and you really need to utilize uh, the resources worldwide to uh, identify um, prospective treatments for cancer. Uh, and uh, all the projects that I see all over the world, uh, mm -hmm. they usually tend to unite uh, the, uh, the countries and there needs to be more uh, projects, preferably mm -hmm. without any local and global restrictions, because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, collaboration makes, uh, uh, it's not where one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals 100. And uh, we need to ensure that uh, there is more uh, money going into this uh, industry. Through three years of the pandemic, uh, people have developed uh, uh, different understandings about uh, their appreciation. People have developed the different levels of appreciation of technologies, of medicine, and also of the issue of so-called science. Some have become more cynical. Uh, others are becoming more believing uh, in many of the concepts uh, when they are being informed by scientists. So how do you see this very mixed picture? What does that mean to you when you are working on your projects? So sure, the pandemic was a very um important test of uh, what biotechnology can do uh, for one disease where the entire world is focused on it. And as a matter of fact, uh, what, we've, what we've seen is that the world was not prepared and the level of technology was not there. Uh, so it shows you that in some areas like pandemics, we are not prepared and we need to invest much more into infrastructure, into uh, new technologies and actually global collaborations in order to be prepared because something like COVID um, can come again, right? And most likely it will. We, the world just has too many people. We're 8 billion people on the planet and mm -hmm. uh, there are some people that are living beyond poverty line and they are not getting the help they need in order to avoid diseases and avoid uh, um, uh, uh, incubating more of those uh, uh, mm -hmm. dramatic diseases. And there are many mm -hmm. animals and we have global warming. So uh, this thing will happen again and we need to ensure that we are prepared. Final question. There has been a lot of talk about the global south, what they need, what they aspire to do, and how it will contribute and can contribute. But at the same time, we all know that most of the uh, population in the world that needs support are actually coming from those parts of the world. So how do you, when you are trying to develop a new drug, new technologies uh, that would help uh, the health of the human race, uh, are articulating questions like this? So sure, uh, the way we address uh, the challenges of the global south and exploit the opportunities presented by the global south is first of all, we focus on the development of small molecule drugs. 
The beauty of small molecule drugs is that uh, they are very easy to make. Uh, they are cheap. They are You can store them for a very long time. You can administer them uh, very cheaply. You don't need to have expensive syringes if it's an oral uh, drug. And most mm -hmm. of the drugs that we try to develop are oral. Uh, so you can take them as a, as a pill. So you don't need to inject. Nowadays, the world is struck with this anti-obesity um, uh, wave of new therapeutics. And most of those, you actually, they are super expensive. They're um, uh, they're difficult to administer, uh, difficult to store, difficult to ship, uh, and they don't go off patents that easily, right? So many of the cancer, under cancer therapies are just like that. Uh, so if you want to service the developing world, you need to ensure that you can develop very cheap drugs uh, that go off patent, uh, and once they go off patent, they're very cheap to make and can be turned into generics. So we, fo we focus on that. We also... Um, when we uh, develop uh, biomarker strategies, when we are developing any kind of go-to-market, we're trying to ensure that all of the um, races and uh, population groups are addressed. Uh, so we need to ensure that the drug works for everybody. And if the drug works for everybody, it should work for the global south as well, even though it's more economically feasible to develop this drug and to conduct clinical trials in the US and China uh, and maybe a few other geographies where it, uh, the, the, economic, uh, um, uh, the, eco the, the economic conditions allow for the development uh, and commercialization of the drug. Uh, because when you are developing the drug from scratch, you need to invest a lot of money. As I mentioned, uh, it's about $2 billion to develop a drug um, and 90% uh, failure rate, right? So, of course, you would focus originally on the uh, it, geographies and economies where that are willing to pay for those uh, uh, for those efforts, uh, and then you can propagate that cost down in emerging geographies. One big part of the global south is actually the Middle East, and uh, uh, that area is uh, extremely wealthy. It's currently the melting pot. That's what New York used to be in the uh, uh, you know early 1900s. Uh, so it's welcoming everybody and uh, super neutral with uh, a lot of uh, investment. And now the Middle East said that, look, we don't want to be poor, right? We are the largest producers of energy and we want to now innovate. We want to be, we don't want to be left behind. And that's why some countries decided to uh, get out of the you know, modes where they had religious police on the streets. Uh, they opened up. Uh, and uh, they started making friends with East and West uh, and uh, ensuring that uh, they actually contribute to the rest of the global South. Um, so we should see some wealth distribution and better health care for this entire uh, geographical area, thanks to the Middle East. Alex, I learned a lot. Thank you so much for joining us and all the best to your project. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.